Welcome back. Now I remember. We were just facing our own death. At the behest of this pleasant looking dragon, which does appear to be something that might have been created in response to Zifnab's more dormant green creature. You find that words completely fail you. You lie helpless, trembling under the claw of this dragon. He rears back, inhaling. Flames leak from his nose and mouth. When he appears about ready to loose his fiery blast, something catches his eye. Immediately he curtails back to stare at the brightly glowing stone that Zifnab gave you. Lexi, point out that he's a wyvern and send him into an identity crisis. Exactly. What is this? This wasn't made by the puny rune magic that you use. How did you come by it? You can't even form the first word of an answer, and it seems that this dragon doesn't really expect one. His other four claw reaches out and delicately removes the stone from your possession. He draws the stone up to his eye for closer inspection. In reaction, he hisses and roars and waves his neck back and forth wildly, sinuously, spouting flame everywhere. This should not exist! It is impossible! There is only me, Sangrax! I am the wave! You don't mind if I relieve you of this stone, do you? You will certainly have no need of it shortly. He tosses the stone away. It falls on a pile of rocks of similar shape and size. The only way you can distinguish it from the others is by its shine, which is like the sun. Suddenly you take notice of a flurry of a furry form splayed on the ground. You realize that your dog has been silently crawling towards you on its belly, braving the aura of fear that keeps you helpless. Every inch is a struggle, and it seems that at any second the dog will bolt, but it keeps coming. It does seem to like us, and it seems to have even more courage than it did about that cave. When it gets near, a quiet whimper escapes its throat, barely audible, but loud enough to attract the attention of the dragon. <laughs> this is your rescue? A life form lower than yourself? I will give it this. The dog is certainly braver than you, patron. <laughs> the dragon rears back and fills the cavern with laughter. This gives the dog just enough time to crawl within reach. It looks at you plaintively, even puts its muscle muzzle into your outstretched hand. <laughs> the sun falls into a pile of other planets. How will you ever... <laughs> Excellent. Perhaps the dog is wishing you a fond farewell. It knows what is about to happen. I was simply going to kill you, but I've reconsidered. I won't oh. merely end your life, patron. I will eliminate every trace of you. I am going to destroy your soul. You will no longer exist on this or any other plane. Should not have brought that stone into my presence. Prepare yourself for oblivion, patron. It started out by laughing along with its own speech. Maybe it was recovering from that joke as well. Dragon rears back again. You assume that no distraction is going to keep it from completing its task this time. You take one look at your struggling companion and draw some strength from his bravery. You might have the wherewithal to do something if only you can figure out what to do. Yeah, I'm guessing we only have one move here. Good thing we saved. Um, why is the stone still in our inventory? <laughs> Quick self-immolate and steal the weapon's thunder. Yes, exactly. Okay, the stone's gone. And he is salivating onto the floor. Got it. Well, we could possess the dog. What's that going to do for us? He'll kill us. And then we'll be in the dog's body, and then we'll eventually become one with the dog. That doesn't help us too much. Uh, we could use the Arrow of Doom. Wow, we have 20 points just for this. But we still don't have a bow. There's not much else we can do. We got a dog. We got a Sangdrax. 
What do you say? Cold? Uh, not a bad idea. I mean, it's an idea. I'm guessing that the actual solution has something to do with what we see before us. And I think that if we try and we can go west or east. But I'm guessing he'll just kill us. I'm really tempted to possess the dog. Let's see what happens. Man, this spell has been... It's played more of a role than I thought it would. Fetch the stone, Valiant! Right. You trace the runes, and so on and so on. Your soul flies into the dog's body just as Sangdrax lets loose the blast of fire. The dog's reflexes leap you away, keeping you from harm. This doesn't save your body, though. The flaming column burns a hole clear through its chest. You can actually see the glowing rock floor below. Wow! It didn't just burn our entire body. It was a very focused bolt of fire, if you will. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> now to take care of his mangy pets. So he didn't catch what, what, what we did. He breathes in, preparing another blast. 25 points for this. Okay. Sick, right? There's the pile of rocks. Can we smell our scent on the stone because we had held it? Well, it did let us do it. Yeah, it looks like that didn't work. The rock pile smells just like a rock pile. Aw, you can't, you can't smell Hablo on it? The dragon's second torrent of fire totally obliterates the dog and with it... Your soul. I guess not. I'm done. Okay. Well, we can dash. We can bark. I kind of wonder if this is even a... Hmm. Like, have we gone down a path further than we already should? Let's go east. The bulk of the dragon blocks your escape in that direction. Your only path lies west into the city. We can go west. Let's give that a try. You bolt into the city, narrowly missing the dragon's second torrent of flame. Scared almost out of your mind, you dart into the cluster of buildings. You pad into the narrow alleys, into narrow alleys and twisting side streets. Soon, when you feel you might have lost the dragon, you wander into an open building. Goodness me. Well, looks like we escaped the dragon for the moment. This is the meeting chamber of the Sartan High Council. Are these them? Seats ring the speaking area where you stand. Robed figures are filling the seats surrounding you. They all move slowly, yawning as if just awakened. I was about to wonder how they could still be alive, but... I suppose if we just awakened them by removing the seal on this city, that would make sense. What do we have here? A dog? I haven't seen a dog for ages. But then again, I've been asleep for that long. Hello, boy. I'm Sama. How'd you get in here? Did you come with the Sartan forces from the other realms? This guy did just wake up. He crouches down, gives your head a pat, and looks deeply into your eyes. Suddenly his face grows, goes stone sober, and his eyes grow hard. He retracts his hand as if fearful of your biting it off. This dog is no dog. It is a vessel for another's soul. The soul of a patron. He has a cool voice. He addresses the councilman now fully assembled. The councilman gasps and yells, but Samo waves his hand and the room hands and the room quiets. We found no other Sartan, no rescue forces. All we discovered were the charred remains of one man and these items. Uh-oh, that must be our inventory. 
and our body. This isn't good. But he seems to know what's going on. So, and these are like some of the most powerful magic users that have ever existed. So maybe, maybe? Friends, we have a very unusual situation. Our ward has fallen. This roused us from our slumber as predicted. But instead of greeting the Satan rescue forces as we expected, all we find is a dog carrying a patron's soul. We need answers, and the only source is this patron. While he exists inside of the dog, he cannot communicate. I suggest that we restore the patron to his original form so that we can question him. Aw, oh, man. My thought was that they were going to heal my body and then help me get back into it, at which point I could just touch it, right? But I'm kind of worried that we're going to be transformed from the dog form into a human form. Does that mean our souls will be forever joined kind of thing? Bring a patron here? To our very heart? Have you forgotten that the patrons are our mortal enemies? I say leave him in the dog's body. Soon he'll forget he ever was a patron, and he'll be no threat to us. Do you know what is happening out there? Where are our fellows? Why is this patron here? How long have we slept? It is very possible that the patrons have been rehabilitated as intended. Perhaps this is our rescuer. Is this how you would treat such a guest? No. We shall restore him, and we shall have our questions answered then. It is the only way. These council members certainly are of varied minds, aren't they? And this guy seems rather optimistic and willing to exercise some good faith. He does hold true to the notion that the point of the labyrinth was rehabilitation. Even if the question of whether it was right to imprison the patrons is still debatable. Whatever you might think of me, Councilman, I am no fool. You may prepare the nullification element. We will administer it to the patron after he is restored. Oh. Oh, I see. First of all, the text description says the Councilman folds his arms and stares sternly at Sama, unwilling to cross him. Oh, I see but willing to risk displaying his feelings. Sama continues, So, apparently our supernatural ability to know some people's names has kicked in, and we are now speaking to Sama. If so, this is the single person responsible for the sundering in the first place. The councilman grunts in approval. Oh, and I think Sama has just said that he'll get the answers and then he's still willing to kill us, so isn't that great? <laughs> Just our luck. Then fetches a bottle filled with water. He traces a quick spell in the air which flows into the liquid. Do we get to see the spell? After a moment of light, the bottle looks absolutely normal. Impressive, guys. Good job. You notice that while you are watching the lone Sartan and his bottle, the entire council has gathered around you. Together they weave an incredibly complex spell that appears to require them all. Like a blanket, the spell falls over you, sinks into your flesh. Oh, man. The dog's body reacts violently to the start and magic. Limbs stretch, tendons pop. Your bones start to expand and twist. You let, you, you let loose yowls of pain one after another. But notice that each one sounds a little more like a human scream than the last. Finally, you lay on the ground, panting and hurting, but in what seems to be your own comfortable body. Your hands, you feel hands draw you up and clothe you in the garments that remain from the dragon's attack. Then someone pours cool, clear water down your throat. You accept it eagerly. He is part of us forever now. I guess so. Yeah. Who knows what spell that was? Holy heck. Also, did we never take off the Clytus' black robe? It was damaged in the back anyway. And our old clothes? I guess they're still good enough to keep wearing. Shirt might be a little damaged, don't you think? What have you done to me, Sartan? You've taken my magic away! A dramatic performance there, Haplo. You drink all of the water offered and soon notice a tingling sensation. 
Soon the water has removed your ability to cast spells. You are as helpless as a newborn against these Sartan. What have you done to me, Sartan? You've taken my magic away! How will I self-immolate now? Um, I guess the nullification element was that. He doesn't want to kill us. So, that's better than we thought. Calm, my friend. What we have done is temporary, and for your protection as much as ours. You have imbibed some nullified water. This eliminates all of your magical possibilities. While you cannot bring any possibilities into this reality, neither can any be placed upon you. Mm. This means that although you cannot cast any spells, you are invulnerable to others' magic as well. You have been nullified. It will continue for only as long as we need to question you. That's pretty cool. Gosh, this Sama, he really is civil. It's for your protection just like handcuffs are for our protection. Yeah, right. Now let us begin. Who are you? Why are you here? How did you get into the city? I'm not talking. Hmm. Let's go with this. Aren't you the same Sama who originally sundered the world? Who banished my people into the labyrinth? Yes, I am that. I know that you can't understand this, but it was all necessary. It was part of a larger plan. I'll explain everything after you tell me what you know. It does seem that the text glitching from the DOS simulation has indeed been fixed now that we've been testing it for an hour or two. Hmm... This does seem sincere. I'm gonna bank on that Sama understands or will at least take criticism without just destroying us, so let's try this. I've seen your plan in action. You couldn't have done more damage to more lives if you tried. I'm starting to get that impression, although I am loath to believe it. If you would tell me your story, I would understand much better. Let's move to a question. Do you know how long you've been sleeping? Not really. I'm starting to think that it may have been much longer than I intended. You've been asleep for over 2,000 years. 2,000 years? How is that possible? You must tell me what has happened. This just keeps getting more confusing. Let's do it. All right, Sartan. You want the truth? I'll give it to you. You launch into a tirade, personally blaming Sama for leaving the labyrinth masterless, turning it into a slaughterhouse that thirsted for your people's death. You recount the thousands of years of struggle and bloodshed which even, your, which even now plagues your race. You describe your lord's unprecedented escape and tell how he selflessly and safely led others, including yourself, out of the labyrinth. You state that his thirst for revenge against the Sartan is unequaled. If you kill me, others will follow. Even now, our army outnumbers that of the surviving Sartan. I've seen your forces. I know where they are, and I know that my lord will destroy them effortlessly. You can't win! You continue by recounting your experiences and describing the state of the Sartan on each of the worlds. Sama cries openly at the description of the dead Sartan and their crystal resting places on Arianas. He seems genuinely confused by the antics of Zifnab on Priyan. He recoils on learning of the practice of necromancy on Abarak, and he listens closely to your account, to the account of your battle with Sangrax and of your escape. I have much to say about what you have told me. Your people, you have been wronged. I wish I could change what has happened, but I cannot. It seems that we took on far too much. We thought we were gods, that we were infallible. We weren't. And both of our races have paid the price. However insane you think it might have been, there was a purpose to the plan. 
We tried to create worlds in which the Mensch would thrive once they were united and the realms were interconnected. What your Lord seeks to do is collect all of the seal pieces to reform the original world. He doesn't understand what this means. His efforts will result in the death of many of the Mensch left alive in the new realms. Go on. Perhaps he does understand. By decimating the opposing force even before the war is joined, he ensures his success. I'm not sure the Mensch left alive will enjoy the slavery he undoubtedly plans for them. What he may not realize is that this will affect his own race as well. Many of his people will die in the Reformation. Do you think he would risk that? It sounds like he might after that last conversation. You consider, you know your Lord's ambition. From his research, he probably already knows how the Reformation will affect the Mensch, and you suspect that he may be willing to sacrifice his own people to further the cause of conquest. You understand that he views you individually as expendable. But just how far does his view of expendability extend? He has claimed in the past that there are always casualties in war. You may be right, Sama. I'm not sure about your plan, but perhaps the Reformation isn't the correct path. I'll return to my lord and discuss it. For now, I'll leave your seal piece here. <sighs> I'm very glad that you see things this way. I hope that we can begin a new era of peace together. Go back to your lord. Tell him that I will gladly speak with him. But I have one important question before you go. What exactly happened to Sandrax after you escaped from him? That is an important question, Mr. Sema. <laughs> As you consider the question, one of the men who brought your possessions into the room begins to writhe. He tears off his robe and metamorphosizes into the gigantic shape of Sangdrax. The Sartan dive for safety behind the benches. Only Sama and yourself remain standing in the open. Sangdrax ignores the assembly, glides over to the sealed piece upon the wall, and grabs it between two talons. Thank you, patron, for painting such a vivid picture of all of the worlds, including your own. That lovely place called the Labyrinth, definitely a realm after my own heart. You see, I feed on fear and chaos, and I can't see a better way to produce such things than by allowing your lord to proceed with his plan. However, since you appear to have lost your nerve, I'll have to take your place. Oh, good. The dragon's eyes focus on you, but for some reason you don't experience the wave of fear that accompanied his presence at your last meeting. Alongside of you, Sama is shivering. He looks terrified. I wonder why we are immune. Oh, because we're nullified. And that must have been a magical effect. Got it. Your lord trusts you, does he not? Especially when you are doing what he wants. I shall take your ship, go to the Nexus, and deliver this seal piece to him. I'm guessing that it will complete his collection. Then I shall lead him to the Vortex, where he can perform the Rite of Reformation. I'm so sorry you decided to turn against your lord. I'm sure that he doesn't view traitors in a very good light. Well, now we have an evil dragon which has taken our form. I shall take your ship, go to the Nexus, deliver the seal piece. You'd be correct about the gas. And then you'll lead him to the Vortex. I guess the Vortex was the site of the original Sundering. I see. So that's what's going to happen. I assume that Sangdrax has a way to get to Zar. Lexi, you think it's because the dog is part of us? I thought about that, but the dog was still clearly very scared. I'm pretty sure it's because we're not affected by magic. That seems much more likely if we just don't feel it. I do hope you won't die in the ensuing chaos. All of you. I'd love to meet you again. We have much to discuss, and an eternity of pain during which we can discuss it. It's hard to say how that vocal effect is accomplished, but it sounds like it might actually be hapless voice actor reading and overlaid with a, a second reading from Sangrax's voice actor. But it could just be a pitch shift echo thing. He strolls out of the building before you can say a word. Right. Only after the dragon has left do the councilmen emerge. Sama unclenches his jaw and forces himself to stop shaking. 
Oh, I guess we have the answer right here. Can't you stop Zangdrax? No, I'm afraid not. His magic is too powerful for us to oppose. When we first arrived here, we built this city and placed the Mensch inside the other sea moons. Stone enclosed islands much like this one. Shortly thereafter, Sangdrax appeared. We don't know where he came from. Unprovoked, he launched an attack against us. He never destroyed us all, just killed a few people. But it was enough to keep us scared and confused. That's all you know about his origin? We never had a chance to defeat him. He commands some form of magic that is foreign to us, more powerful than the rune-based magic that we use. We erected the ward around the city as a last-ditch effort against him. Evidently, it worked. The ward was designed to keep out all foreign magic. Since he consisted almost entirely of pure magic, he could not enter. He is very magic-based, it sounds like. Yeah, good question. We decided to enter our sleep capsules. We expected that when the others had learned that we were in danger, they would gather here to help us defeat Sangrax. We keyed our awakening to occur when the ward had fallen, assuming that it would happen only when the other Sartan had arrived. We never dreamed that thousands of years would pass before the ward fell. Now that it has, Sangrax is loose. Not only is he a threat to us, but with your ship, he has access to all of the worlds. And if he succeeds in causing the reformation, we'll all probably die in the process anyway. Why didn't we put a combination lock on our ship? Why wasn't I affected by the dragon's aura of fear? It sure had me in its grasp last time I encountered it. That's because you had been nullified. Remember, nullifying water eliminates your vulnerability to magic as well as your ability to cast spells. Sangdrax's aura of fear didn't affect you because no magic could affect you. So why don't you all just nullify yourselves and then walk around? Because, you know, they can't use magic either, and I suppose they haven't built so much as a dagger. You know, Ziphnab gave me a stone to use against some ultimate evil. Do you think this might prove effective against Sangdrax? I don't know. Tell me about it. It sounds like this might be some other kind of magic. Perhaps made from the same source that created Sangdrax himself. It may be that Sangdrax is vulnerable to it. Where is it? I didn't see it along with your possessions. <laughs> Sangdrax got hold of the stone and tossed it into a pile of rocks which look exactly like it. I don't have a clue which one it is. I'm afraid I can't help you there. I never saw the stone to begin with, so I wouldn't be any help in finding it now, lost among similar rocks. I do hope you're able to get it back, though. Judging from the way Sangdrax reacted to it, it sounds as if that stone is our only hope to defeat the dragon. Safer than to sip nullifix every night with dinner for a healthy and happy existence. The end. Exactly. That's the moral of the story. Well, why don't we just, like, take Facebook and put it next to the pile of rocks and then look for the green glow? Oh, look, we can ask this about the nullification thing. Bit of a tongue-in-cheek remark. If that's so, why didn't you all tank up with the water and go after him? His magic wouldn't do a thing against you. Uh, this is true, although we would be helpless as well as invulnerable. While the water was in effect, we would not be able to use our magic against Sangrax. We could only confront him physically. He can choose any form. In a purely physical battle, he would destroy us hands down. How did Sangdrax take my form? That's one of his powers. He can assume the form of anyone or anything he desires. The talent renders him insidious as well as invincible. Where is Sangdrax leading, my lord? The Vortex? Yes. The Vortex is the one place that the Reformation ritual can be enacted. It is where we originally sundered the world. It's also the only place where the interconnection can begin. So, the Vortex, yes. Not exactly clear where it is. Oh, look, there's that's our next question, too. 
Okay, man, but like pitchfork sticks. Sneak up on him while he's napping. Lexi. I don't know if you've heard of this game called Breath of the Wild. Where is the vortex? The only place from which the vortex can be entered is in the labyrinth. We reasoned that this would be the safest place to hide the portal. It may be that your lord will balk at traveling the length of the labyrinth again the wrong way, but Sangdrax can be very persuasive. He will convince him, one way or another. That's great news, Lexi. Do you hear this? Apparently the entrance to the vortex, the one place the world could be reformed or interconnected, and from which it was sundered, is in the middle of the labyrinth? Like, right at the bad place? And that's where they hid it? They just did a total, like, scarlet letter thing? Oh, wow. And now we can actually ask about the interconnection. Holy heck. We're getting big here. What exactly is the interconnection? We designed the realms to work together. Each had specific functions to perform in the overall plan. The interconnection was to tie all of the worlds together. Abarak would produce raw materials. Arianus would take those materials and refine them to produce manufactured goods. Prion would supply power to the other worlds. Celestra was to provide a place for most of the people to live and purify some of the toxins from the other worlds, notably Abarak. That's, I think, the clearest description we've had of the full picture of what role each world would have. That's pretty cool. So Abarak's main function was to produce raw materials, what with all that molding and lava that's going on there. And then Arianus would refine them, Prion would power them, and Celesta would... Cel Celesta was supposed to be the main home. That's pretty cool. They put it there because if the realms ended up working together, that would be a sign that the Sartan need to fix their relationship with the patrons. Now fully peaceful. So the Sartan would journey to the labyrinth, and together they would reform the world. Yeah, is that s sincere? It sounds like it might be sincere. The realms were never designed to survive on their own for an extended time. And yet, that's exactly what they've had to do. It's not too late, though. From what you've told me, Abarak is dying. The interconnection is the only thing that can save it. It's the only alternative to reformation. And he knows about reformation, too. I wonder why he framed it that way. All right. What is his plan? Presumably now that he's awake and he's the guy in charge, he intends to go through with it, right? So what is he going to do? How do you start the interconnection? Much like the Reformation, it requires all five of the seal pieces. In the center of the vortex is a floating island. It has four spires. Each spire represents an element. Air, fire, stone, and water. The seal pieces must be placed upon each corresponding spire. Then the spell itself must be ignited. This is done by placing the focus over the correct rune and inserting the nexus seal piece into it. Oh. So there is a fifth seal piece. I think that's the one that is a... Is it in Zar's dwelling? We've never taken it because we've never needed it for anything. So, four pillars at the vortex... You need to put each seal piece in the corresponding spire. And then there's something called a focus, which can be placed over the correct rune. Let's get some more details on this, on this stuff. Spires? Focus? What are you talking about? Well, you did ask. The floor of the island is laid out with many interconnecting runes. Each rune can be used to ignite a distinct spell. Depending on the rune you choose, the function of the spell will be different. The Reformation requires that the spell be ignited from one particular rune, the interconnection, another. This guy is being pretty forthright. He's not treating this information as top secret. The focus is a hexagonal frame that floats over the island's floor. You can move it over the rune of your choice. When you place the Nexus seal piece inside of it, the focus automatically ignites the rune under it, which casts the spell. Yeah, he's really being forthcoming. Unless he's making all this up or something. Which is the starting rune for the interconnection spell? It would be too difficult to describe. 
Though I will tell you that we left the focus over that room. We intended to return and ignite the interconnection spell someday. They left the focus over that room. All right. Let's back up a step. Certainly. This is good stuff. Let's talk about the other worlds. Could we talk a little about the other worlds? Very well. What would you like to know? Hmm. Let's start with Zifnab. Do you know who Zifnab is? I know of no Zifnab, but I doubt that is his true name. He sounds like a valuable ally if he knows as much as you say and has access to magic outside of our mastery. He does seem somewhat powerful, although he doesn't seem to like to show off. Why'd you react so strongly when I told you about necromancy? Necromancy was banned for many reasons soon after it was discovered. The most important reason being that when someone dead is raised, someone else will die untimely. This maintains the balance. By relying on necromancy, the people of Aberak have doomed our race. The magic doesn't recognize the boundaries of the realms. It kills Sartan as far away as Arianus and Prion. It wiped out thousands. Oh, gosh. So they must have had the plague in the other realms, too. I don't suppose the mench races exist anywhere else other than in these four realms. Why is everyone here alive and well? <laughs> it's actually ironic. The war that we constructed to repel the magic of Sangdrax must have had the effect of repelling the magic of necromancy as well. It kept us alive against two dangers. But now, we only have hundreds of people left, where once we had tens of thousands. We shall try to reconstruct our lives, to help our brethren on Aberak, if there is a world left to live on. That is a good explanation. So they were just killing the sleeping Sartan one by one by resurrecting others in a different realm? And these ones were protected by the ward? Gosh. Lucky dudes. Let's go back a step. Certainly. Sure would be helpful if I had another ship. Or I could forget the ship and just jump into action. Do you have another ship that I can use to pursue him? Yes, certainly. Oh. In fact, as we've been speaking, I've had another ship placed in the same port where you landed. How convenient for the You're programmers. Welcome to it. There is, however, one problem. We seem to be a little short on steering stones. It takes quite a while to magically prepare a stone sphere to accept the naming runes that guide a ship through the Death Gate. The only such stone we have is the ceremonial globe in this very chamber, and you can't use that. Why can't we use the ceremonial globe? Don't you think saving the worlds is worth sacrificing your precious ceremonial globe? Not at all. You see, the globe was placed in this room before the building's construction was complete. It's too large to fit through any of the exits. It's also far too heavy to move any distance by hand. You're welcome to it if you can find a way to transport it. But then, it doesn't have any of the naming runes on it anyway. I don't think that the globe is the solution to this problem. Lexi says, good thing they never went out for a walk right when someone was resurrecting an Abarakian Sartan. Yes. Right. Why can't I use it? It big. <laughs> and heavy. I don't have time for talk. Now's the time for action. <laughs> Very well. If I can be of any further assistance, do not hesitate to ask. Okay. You notice that sometime during your conversation with Sama, the nullification spell wore off. You now have command of your magic back again. You have learned a spell. Oh, that was the spell we saw cast. Was that to make water into healing water? Let's check it out. Oh, null water. It didn't make it into healing water. It made it into null water. That's cool. I don't have time for talk after that long talk we had. Precisely. Mm. 
Oh my goodness gracious. That rug is nice. There's the globe. It's a rune-covered sphere of stone precariously balanced on a small stand. Precariously, eh? I'm guessing we could move it a little. Although it's undoubtedly secure, it looks like an errant breath could roll the globe off. The rug looks like it has a tree on it? Yes, exactly. You should hang that rug. People shouldn't be walking on that rug. We can take the rug? Let's just look at it. A carpet takes up most of the speaking area's floor. It depicts a beautiful scene. A single tree stands in a lush field at the end of Dr. Mario. <laughs> yeah, we could take the rug. And it looks like we can leave, too. Uh, Sangdrax is supposedly gone. But I have another idea. This spell does look dangerously similar to necromancy now that we've seen both of them. You trace the familiar spell into the air. When it takes effect, it's as if the picture in the carpet comes into focus, taking on a new dimension. The scene, a single tree in a lush clearing, is real. I agree with you, Lexi. We do need a rug. But wouldn't it be nice if the rug had a steering stone in it? You get behind the globe and push it. Push against it with all of might. The stone sphere creaks, then rolls off of its stand, bounces down the steps, breaking them, <laughs> and ends up on the carpet. Only it doesn't stop there, colon, capital. Since the carpet is now a portal into the other wear, the globe falls into it. You see it continue to roll until it hits the tree in the scene. There it is. Be cool if we could finally take a stand in this game. The stand has been affixed to the floor. Big surprise, eh? Yep. And I guess that's where you'd have the seal, but the seal's not here. Maybe it's just not here. What's with these, like, monk chefs in the background? That guy doesn't have a hat. There's this guy. That one is Sama. I recognize him. Councilman. The councilman ignore you. <laughs> Yoink. You roll the carpet and take it from the floor. We could have entered the rug. That's cool. Hang on. I want to enter it. You step on the rug as if you were going to walk over it, but end up falling into the scene. Your orientation changes. Suddenly, the direction you were walking becomes up. Your balance goes for a holiday, and you tumble onto the lush grass of a clearing. Oh, cool! You inhabit the scene woven into the rug. A lone tree stands in a lush field. In front of it, you see the portal. That's cool. Can we climb these suckers? You climb up the nearest tree and look out over an impenetrable forest. It extends as far as you can see. Evidently, the artist who created this carpet didn't think much beyond the immediate scene. Yes. This is great. I could live here. Who needs a house when you have a rug? That's the thing. All right, we're going to exit this. But I think we will re-enter this place when we need to push the stone back out of it. Oh, and the carpet becomes static again? Huh. That is magic that really does play on possibilities. All right. Uh, if in case I don't see the council again, nice to meet you guys. No female council members yet? Hmm. Now that you've removed the ward, blah, blah, blah. Yes. It is wondrous. Okay, well, it's nice to know that we're not going to encounter a giant ultimate evil dragon here. But I sure would like to find that stone. Now that Sangdrax is left, the stone is no longer reacting to his magic by glowing. It looks like every other rock on the pile. Finding it is going to be an impossible chore. Well, we've got to do something. We don't have our dog anymore now that we are it. 
Can you imagine all of humanity in a huge museum? Each person or family with their own painting. That sounds like a basis for another novel series in itself, doesn't it? Off you go. Typo, typo, typo. So, gosh, I love the music in this game so much, and this one is beautiful and consistent with the rest of the game's music, but... It seems like it could have done a little more to match the beauty of the world. Or maybe if we had an additional musical piece that we got after Songdrax left. The city is really lovely though, isn't it? It's nice just to stare at. Be awesome to explore it, really. Outside of the museum would be gathering places and so on. It would be great, yes. I'm sure you'd correct the typos if you were typing the novel series. A note about the dog. In the novel series, I believe Haplo has a dog from the very beginning. It's not something that he finds along the journey. And the dog is always implied to be somehow connected to Haplo at the level of the soul. Um, as though some kind of magic were responsible for the situation and the relationship. Um, whereas in this game, there is a nod to the dog, certainly. And it looks like we've now seen the full story of the dog. So that's, I suppose, a bit of a homage, but certainly not a faithful representation, as much in this game isn't. The game is based on the books, but clearly they... they felt comfortable taking plenty of liberty with it. Also, I would be more than happy to correct the typos in your novel series. I would scour it. You walk towards the cave, but as you get closer, you begin to feel fear gnaw at your insides. Yes, this is familiar. There's nothing around to inspire such terror, but every step you take toward the cave makes you want to claw your eyes out. Before you're halfway there, you've collapsed on the ground. Magic, you reason. It must be magic. It's an empty glass bottle. Well, if we could fill the bottle with, I don't know, water, and we could nullify the water, then we could probably go in the cave. Looks like we can get out of this world, though. Time for a refreshing sip of Nullifix. The spell surrounds the bottle of water. After a few seconds, it has done its work. Although the water looks the same, you know that it has the magic nullifying effects that you experienced earlier. Down the hatch. <laughs> We've heard that sound once before. That's great. You take a swig of the water. Immediately you sense the effects. Your magic power drains away, making you feel as helpless as a newborn. But this also means that foreign magic cannot affect you. All right, perfectly not scary looking cave. Let's check you out. You're nice on the inside. I kind of like your color scheme better than the outdoor color scheme, even though it is very uplifting in a way. There's no doubt that Sangdrax calls this cave home. Blood streaks the walls, and the floor is littered with the remains of previous meals. Where do you find these meals? Who lived here earlier? Looks like we got some scales. You take the scales. Bones. These must be the bones of the poor fools who chanced upon Sangdrax. The remains are of all races. It appears that the dragon doesn't discriminate. I kind of want to know if we could theoretically cast Resurrection on them, but I'm guessing you'd need a better formed corpse than these things. Yeah, I thought Mench only lived on the other moons, though, so... Well, maybe Sangdrax gets around, though. <gasps> could he have just... Like, already totally purged this world entirely of the Mench races while the Sartan were asleep? And Sam was like, we just didn't get a chance to defeat him. Sorry. Oh my gosh. Well, at least he got a lot of them, if they are here. Sharp stone spikes jut into the cave from the ceiling and floor. What is the mnemonic for memorizing stalactites versus stalagmites? G for ground? C for ceiling? Oh, I guess that works, huh? I didn't even think of it. 
but they have the same description. That's as far as we honor the, di the difference in this game. Okay, well, it seems that the only benefit to coming here is that we got some scales. Oh, maybe we can use the scales to trigger the shine of the stone, though. The scales are both sharp and oily. You get the feeling that if you cut yourself on one of them, the wound would become severely infected, perhaps prove fatal. You also sense that the scales of the dragon hold the same chaotic magic that the Sangdrax commands. Yes, I do have that feeling. So it seems like that would help us out. All right, have some scales. You spread the dragon's scales over the pile of rocks. As you hoped, Zifnab's rock reacts to the magic in the scales by glowing. Now the rock is very visible and easily distinguishable from the other stones in the pile. There it is. Look at it. There's our stone. Crushing it is an option. But we never got a chance to crush the stone. We were never given one. 15 points for taking the stone. You can see the prism of the dome. You mean just way back here? Yeah, of course. All right, Sartan City. Can we take the scales back? <laughs> the scales have slipped through the cracks between the rocks. You have no luck in gathering them up again. Sometimes you need luck. Well, here is our ship. It sure looks a lot like our ship. Oh, but they were both Sartan ships, weren't they? Zar did say that the Sartan had left the original ship for us. And he took that as almost like an insult. No slashing Zar with scales, I guess. Gonna have to offer him a candy bar. Right? Alright, I think it's time to... There we go. Oh, Sama's ship. The ship was actually titled that. You hang your carpet... You can hang the carpet over the nearest support beam. I see, we just drape it over. That's nice. It makes for quite a nice decoration. Doesn't it, though? All right, let's get into that rug. <laughs> Once again, the music synchronized well with the runes. All right, let's push this sucker. Again, you gather your strength and heave the boulder-like globe towards the portal. It rolls without much problem. He said it was heavy. In fact, as soon as the globe is partway through it, gravity on the far side grabs the sphere from your hands. The globe disappears. Be nice to stay here for a while. 20 more points for that. We're just racking up the points. Good aim! All right. You step through the portal back onto your ship. As soon as you leave, the carpet reverts back to its original state. You stand in the cramped bridge of Sama's ship. It has the navigational wheel and the globe where the steering stone should be. Curious to use the steering wheel. Wait a minute. If we're going to transfer runes. Fortunately. Gosh, Edmund's pendant. Sure coming in handy, isn't it? There are other bubbles. You transfer the pendant onto the stone globe. That just looks like a kind of cheap overlay by comparison. And there was no little animated sequence. There are other bubbles in this realm. Yeah, I want to use the steering wheel to see what... Uh... Yeah, they're called... What are they called again? Moons? Dome moons? I forget. You don't know of any places to travel to in this realm. I guess we could... Yeah, usually that's the that's the thing with Haplo. He needs to be told about them. I guess it's a bit of a stretch in this case. Um... But we don't have the seal piece. Can we leave without it? We said we would leave it with Sama. But we also said that we would... We kind of gave him his word that we would go and talk to Zar. Hmm. And then we would come back here and convene with Sema. 
and saying Drax called us a traitor. So that's what we'll do. Let's try going back home. That was before the saying Draxening. Once again, I'm finished with my tea. It always seems to happen by the time I get to the ship. Death's Gate. Still totally not clear why they call it that, really. Are we back? Yep. Um, Zara didn't like hearing about Edmund. I don't suppose he'll enjoy hearing about Sama. His worst enemy, I would say. That's because you know you shouldn't drink and drive. Yes, perhaps it is, perhaps it is that. We still have more null water, though. All right, Zar. Oh, we went to the Labyrinth Gate. Uh... And this time, the gate is open. That doesn't seem promising. Yeah, it looks like he's gone. Um... He has left the book, though. Uh, yoink! Let's just look at it. The thick book is titled The History of the Sundering. It's incredibly old and is somewhat water damaged. Hmm. They were both fixed to the wall and, Z and Zar released it. Well, here we are, back at Zar's desk where we began this adventure. And Zar is no longer here. He has apparently left for the labyrinth and left us the book that he's been studying, perhaps not knowing that that's what he was doing, because he is in the hands of an imposter who represents the ultimate evil. All in a day's work. 